Hello everyone and welcome back to our lecture on trilobites and other arthropods where we're going to be looking at the morphology or the anatomy of these animals. I'm going to use the word morphology uh, more throughout this course I think because that's what we tend to use in paleontological circles. So without further ado let's get the lowdown on trilobite anatomy. Remembering what I said in the first lecture about the, the uh, nature of words in paleontology and with apologies I'm going to introduce you to the vital vocabulary that you'll need to sound like you know what you're talking about when it comes to trilobites. So you may want to um, rehearse these. I provided you with a, uh, a diagram of a trilobite on blackboard that you can label as you go along with these terms. And I would recommend, for example, doing so either on your screen on a, um, a piece of uh, digital image manipulation software, if you so wish, or you can print it out and label it. This will help you kind of get an idea of both where these things are in relation to each other and also it will help you remember the words themselves. So the bodies of arthropods are split into specialized regions as I've already mentioned in the last video and these are called tagmata. So um, the specialization of these regions is a thing called tagmosis and in trilobites and close relatives to these there are three tagma. So there are three tagmata, I should say. Um, these are the cephalon. This is the head at the front of the animal. The thorax. This is the middle bit of the animal when we're going from head to tail, so anterior to posterior. And there is the pygidium. This is the posterior most part of the animal. This is a dorsal view. We're looking down on the top of the animal. A dorsal view for us would be looking that way onto our bodies. So their exoskeleton is also longitudinally divided, as I've already mentioned, into three different lobes, hence the name trilobite, the axial one in the middle here, and then the plural ones either side. So the trilobite exoskeleton, um, which you can see um, the major features of in this diagram here, is composed almost entirely of calcite. These are really quite chunky creatures. The axial lobe protects a digestive system which runs from a mouth underneath the, the uh, structure here called the glabella, we'll get onto that in a second, through the body towards an anus here at the back of the animal. The pleural lobes are either side of the axial lobe and those cover the appendages, the legs and the gills. So let's dive in a bit to the cephalic, the cephalon, uh, so the cephalic anatomy of these creatures. In the middle, there is a raised area shown in gray here and labeled called the glabella. This has a series of furrows drawn on here towards the back. Those are the glabella furrows. Eyes are developed on the side of the um, cephalon. So here and here. These are compound, meaning they're made of many different lenses. Um, if you think, for example, a, uh, about a dragonfly, a dragonfly's eye is a compound eye. It has lots and lots of lenses. Um, and they're really interesting, and actually they're really quite spectacular. I, if you want, are interested, I highly recommend doing some reading about these, but what's really neat about them is each lens is a calcite crystal, which has an internal doublet structure two lens layers made of different refractive index material acting in combination to correct for focusing problems that comes from a result of having rigid eye lenses. It's really, really cool. Isn't that awesome? Um, oh man, I've become really washed out. I apologize for that, but there you go. It's sunny outside, so I blame the sun. Um, in those trilobites that lack eyes, it's generally thought that this is a, a secondary condition and that there is a trend towards reduction in our eye size and then eventual loss in multiple groups. However, as you can see from the right hand side here, um, there are also taxa where the eyes become really, really prominent. They, they grow out and this particular species um, has a 360 degree vision because they're mounted on a turret that allows them to see um, in all directions, and they have a little um, a lip at the top that provides an eye shade to stop the sun getting in their eyes. Isn't that cool? So awesome. So yeah, eyes are highly variable. The other thing to consider is that there is a facial or cephalic suture 
And this is shown here in this dark black line. Um, and that separates a thing called the free cheek. Sometimes you'll see that being called um, librogenia from the fixed cheek or fixogenia. But free cheek and fixed cheek are the terms that we're going to be using today. And these are lines on the cephalon along which the cephalon separates where the trilobite molts. So the free cheek can actually, actually when molting occurs, um, gets broken off the remainder of the cephalon, hence the name. So facial sutures are really important to the biology of the animal. They allow it to, uh, to molt. But they're also very important to um, the classification within the trilobites. And there are three major arrangements of um, the facial suture that I think you should probably know about. Um, and they're based on where the posterior, so, so the back part of the suture ends, relative to the edge of the head, this thing called the genal angle. In some um, trilobites, there's a spine there that's called the genal spine. In others, you just have a, a, an angle around here. If the facial suture that's marked here with this yellow dashed line ends anterior to the genal angle, those trilobites are called proparian trilobites. If the suture ends on the angle itself, you're looking at a gonataparian, gonataparian um, trilobite. And if the uh, facial suture um, terminates posteriorly uh, to the interior, so towards the glabella of that genal angle, you're looking at an epistosuperian, epistosuperian um, trilobite. So it's all about where this facial suture cuts the um, margin of the cephalon um, relative to that genal angle. So bear in mind that those divisions exist and they're quite important when it comes to dividing up the groups of trilobite. Underneath the cephalon, we find three hardened plates associated with the soft parts of the um, trilobite, which are relatively rarely preserved, including the mouth. So at the anterior margin of the animal, you can see an ex a picture here of the hardened plates kind of exploded and, uh, and shown in three dimensions. You can see the free cheek that we just met here. And at the front, you can see there's a rostral plate. Um, so this kind of is found at the anterior of the animal. Then you can find uh, and see here a thing called the hypostome. And this is a, um, a trilobite that's preserved in ventral aspects. We're actually seeing the underside of this creature here, showing the hypostome. And this is variable in shape and size. It's usually sighted underneath the glabella. It's associated with the uh, mouth. And its shape and position is really useful, again, within classifications within the trilobite. So it's quite important that you know it ex exists and it's called the hypostome. There's one more plate, which is um, called the metastoma. It's small and it's only known from a few taxa and this lay behind the mouth. The thorax comprises a series of separate segments and these are usually similar in shape, but can vary in size. They articulate with each other allowing the trilobite to bend, primarily upwards and downwards. So the articulations in the um, thorax are what allow a trilobite to bend around. The minimum number of articulated, uh, so bendable thoracic segments is two. Typical trilobites will have more than this. For example, 13 is a very common number. And the maximum uh, known is a little over 100. And you can see some of that variation in the images here. And these all, this is also a really good figure for showing you some of the variations in morphology within the trilobites, and indeed sometimes what they look like as fossils, which we'll get back to in um, lecture or in video number three. Underneath the thorax, paired limbs attach close to the midline of the animal and they're spread outwards to the side. Ventral preservation is actually really, really rare in trilobites. It's known from very, very few um, taxa. So I could probably, of all of the thousands of trilobite species, less than 10, give or take, are actually known in terms of the anatomy of their underside. So we really need exceptional preservation to be able to see this. But what we can say is that a typical appendage, as shown on this image here on the left, um, a typical appendage has two branches um, at the bottom are things called nathabases that are used for processing food. Um, and then from that arise a 
filamentous branch to the limb that's used for respiration, and then a walking uh, part of the limb that's used for locomotion. So this is basically a gill, and this is a locomotory appendage. And this, I showed you nicely the relationship of those two, and there's one of those on each side. You can see on the right here, a beautiful example of, the, of um, exceptional preservation where the trilobite has been replaced with pyrite. So we've got a very clear picture within the species of what the zim, limbs actually look like. But that, as I say, that's very, very rare. Thanks to this articulation of the thorax, trilobites can enroll. So you can see two examples in this image of enrolled trilobites. Show you what I mean by that. They take their head and their tail and they roll up to form a bill, uh, sorry, a, a ball, a bit like a pill bug. They did this during times of stress to avoid unpleasant environmental conditions or as a defensive adaptation. Um, we think that most Cambrian taxa, so most early trilobites, probably had a limited ability to roll up. They couldn't do it entirely. But several groups evolved a variety of fairly sophisticated structures that, allow, that kind of enhance this behavior, which first appear in the Ordovician. So for example, some groups can lock parts of the skeleton against each other. A group of what we call the phacopids, 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 I've only read that, I've not really said it out loud many times, so apologies if that's incorrect, had tooth and socket pairs at the front and the back end that lock together allowing the trilobite to create a really tight ball. So that's really, uh, that's a really, really cool adaptation. So be aware that um, trilobites had this behavior. The back end of the trilobite is called the bagidium. This is a plate of between one and 30 fused segments. This is generally small in most Cambrian trilobites. Um, these, this um, arrangement is called micropygus, but generally um, trilobite lineages evolved after this point to have pygidia, um, so that's the plural of pygidiums, pygidium, pygidia, um, which were either slightly smaller than the head or significantly larger. They come in a range of different forms of segmentation. You can see three examples on this slide of where they've been found isolated from the rest of the trilobite that shows just some of the diversity of uh, form that you get in pygidia. And that brings us to the end of the morphology of the trilobites. So in the next video, uh, well, you can watch it sometime soon. But in the meantime, please do take a, a look at the models posted just below this on the website um, in concert with the uh, uh, image that you've been filling in the labels on. And make sure that you've got a good feeling for the 3D relationships of the different parts that I've highlighted in this video. And then there's a fun little quiz for you to do to make sure you've kind of got some understanding of that um, to test yourself. You can do this as many times as you like if you want to repeat it. And then we'll get on to the, to the next video. So thank you very much for your time and attention.